Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Covenant City Church. It's a joy to be able to worship with you all today um, in one voice as God's people. Giving back to Him today collectively, not just individually, but as one body, that which He died for, and that, that is our praises and His glory. Um, this is your first time here. My name is uh, Tazar, one of the elders at Covenant City Church. And at CCC, uh, every Sunday, we really encourage everyone who's here to participate in the act of worship. That means every now and then throughout the liturgy, uh, uh, throughout the worship service, I'm going to invite you guys to stand up, read out loud Bible passages, statement of faith, sit back down, stand back up, pray together, sing, uh, uh, recite scripture together, and I uh, encourage you to join along in the act of worship all together if you are able to, according to your liturgy printouts, and also will be guided in the screen behind me. Okay, uh, so let me pray for us today. Our call to worship today, after I pray, is going to be taken from Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 to 8, and today I wanted to do something dialogical, uh, so that means there'll be parts of uh, the call to worship passage that I will say, and then there will be parts that you guys respond and say together with me. Okay, so allow me to read the non-capitalized parts. Okay, that will be just me. But then it, the parts that you see that are capitalized, that will be the parts where all of us join together and say and, and, and speak it in one voice. Okay, so I'll do the non-capitalized parts and you guys join in, 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 the, in the parts that are capitalized. All right, let me pray for us and then we will uh, begin this time of worship. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would ready our hearts as we enter into a time where you have said in your word for us not to neglect, for us to keep doing uh, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, to come collectively as a body and worship you. Um, for not only are you pleased by it, not only are you um, uh, uh, receiving aromas of victory, as your people, your redeemed children here on earth, sing your praises, recite your gospel, realign the compasses of their hearts for your glory. But also, Father, it does something to our hearts as well. Um, collective worship can do things in our souls that individual worship cannot. And I pray that as we come together here today as one body, those two things will happen. You would be pleased by the act of our worship and that our hearts would be reoriented again to loving the right things and putting first things first so that all other things can be seen in perspective of who you are. Thank you, Father, for this great redemption. Help us continue in this time of worship, not because of things we have done or earned or accomplished in our week, but merely because of your sheer grace and mercy that you've had on wayward children such as us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite us to stand together and let's read out loud our call to worship from Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 to 8. Uh, allow me to read the parts that are not capitalized, and I ask you to join me as we read the parts that are capitalized all together. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Amen. And so while we worship the Lord together, come as you are. Come broken hearted, rescue begin. 
near, come near. Earth has no sorrow, and heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow, and heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your sin. All who are broken. Table, come taste the grace that's best for the weak. Rest that endures, earth has no sorrow, heaven can kill. Earth has no sorrow.
You know, uh, the hard part about doing full-time ministry, pastoring, you know, preaching, all that, is that at the end of the day, the result that we seek to see happen in people's lives is not something that we can control. We can preach the Bible, right? We can uh, teach Bible studies. We can lead community groups. We can do counseling sessions. We can converse with you about the things of God organized worship services like this. But at the end of the day, what we seek to happen is for the people that we minister to to experience what the psalmist in our call to worship uh, passage describes earlier in verse 8. Take a look at it again with me, if you would. What we want to see happen is for you to taste and see that the Lord is good. To taste and see that the Lord is good, okay? But 
we can't make that happen in our life. See, we can teach you about God's goodness. We can reason with you about God's goodness. We can try to imitate for you God's goodness. We can sing with you about God's goodness. We can pray that you taste that God is good. But as C.S. Lewis famously said, there's a big difference between describing the sweetness to honey of honey to someone versus that person actually taking a spoonful of honey and putting it in their mouth. There's a big difference. And that's the end goal, the psalmist says in verse 8, that we all may not just know but taste and see that the Lord is good, but how in the world can I do that for you when I myself rarely taste and see it? I rarely, I know a lot about it, but I rarely taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's not because the Lord isn't good, but it's because I, like I see most of us here, prefer the savory tastes of other things. I, like I see most of us here, prefer to be filled up with easier and quicker meals to where we find ourselves no longer hungry for the only one who can truly satisfy our souls. With that in mind, I do want to invite all of us to read out loud our confession of sin today, taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6b. Let's read out loud in one voice. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Let's pray. Father, we are often presented with so many other things that we have been lied to tastes better than your goodness is more fulfilling than your glory. And we lift up now, Father, our silent prayers of confession where you already know, but um, here we are confessing to you the things this week, this month, um, this past year perhaps that we have found to be sweeter than obedience to your word. Hear now, Father, our solemn prayers of confession. Father, there are too many things for us to list out, too many things in this world that we find to be sweeter than you, and we seek faster than you, and we desire more than you, and we've embraced harder than we have embraced you. But as we lift up these prayers, Father, I pray that you who are glorious and more gracious, you whose ways are different than ours, may once again help us taste and see just how sweet your commitment to your people um, is as we now enter into our time of assurance of pardon. In Jesus' name and in his name alone we pray. Amen. Uh, friends, you know why every Sunday we have in our liturgy, in our order of worship, this time where we confess our sins to to God. Well, one, it's because we believe that in the Bible God told us to have it in a worship service, but two, we believe the reason God told us to have it in a worship service is so that we might actually taste His goodness and not just know it in our heads. See, the braver you are, the more courageous you are in looking at your uh, flaws in the eye, the more courageous you are in looking at your sin in the eye, the more likely it is you might actually taste God's goodness. Look at our call to worship passage again with me, that psalm. Read it again. What kind of person does the psalmist say will truly taste the goodness of, of the Lord? Who's going to taste it? Is it the man who has it all together? Is it uh, the proud man? Is it the strong man who's checked all the boxes? Is it the self-sufficient man who's never in trouble? Is that the person who's going to taste the goodness of God? No. If you read it again, it's who? Look at verse 2. It's the man who's been humbled, he says. Look at verse 4. It's the man who's been delivered, 
he says. Look at verse 6. It's the man who's been saved out of trouble. This is the person who will really taste how good God is. The man who's no longer proud because they've experienced God save and deliver them out of trouble. That's the one who will make the transition from just knowing to tasting. And where, ultimately, does the Bible say we experience this deliverance, this salvation in? Well, let me read to us our assurance of pardon today. I'm just going to read Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. He, Paul says, who is he? Jesus. Has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, or the Father. Has delivered us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's, it's the Father delivering us through the Son. See, I can, I, can, I can preach to you all day about how good God is, but until you accept the fact that you're actually deeply immersed in sin, I can preach to you all day about how loving God is, but until you see the depths of your depravity, I can preach to you about how kind and patient God is all day, but until you see the level of your own brokenness and wretchedness and poverty of spirit, unless you see that, you will never truly taste and see how good God is. And you'll never truly understand how sweet the cross is. And I can't do that for you. So if you're here today and you have tasted the sweetness of the cross, come. Come. Continuing this worship time today, be reminded of it today as, as we continue in worship. But if you're here today and you don't think you've ever tasted it, maybe you've heard about it your whole life. Maybe you've even studied it your whole life. Maybe you've observed and been around it your whole life. But for some reason, you just don't feel like you've truly tasted it. If that's you, I pray that as we continue in our time of worship today, the Spirit of Christ might help you do something in your heart that a preacher never could, so that today you might worship like you've never before. Let's pray. Father, the basis of our worship today is the pride we have in our own accomplishments. If the basis that we come to you today is based on the things we feel like we've earned. This time of worship today will never feel powerful or sweet. But if we, like the person in the psalm, understand that we are but poor men, understand that we are but people needing of deliverance and salvation, uh, then the cross will mean something that it never would unless we acknowledge those things. Help us now, Father, continue this time of worship um, acknowledging the sweetness of the cross as we see our sins redeemed through his blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, friends, as we just talked about, uh, God's love and patience and kindness and forgiveness, uh, those are all real things, but often it's hard to taste and see and sense and feel. Um, this is one of the reasons why, not, not the only reason, but this is one of the reasons why God aids the church with two different types of sacraments such as communion, right, the Lord's Supper, where we actually literally taste and see the body and the blood of Christ as signified by the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, internalizing Christ, becoming one with us as we eat and drink it. And also, what aids the church is another sacrament, which is the sacrament that we'll be participating in today, and that is the sacrament of baptism, where we physically see the water signifying our deliverance, signifying the washing of our sins, flow down from the head of men and women who have tasted and seen the sweetness of this cross. And today we get to participate in the baptism of two such people. Um, so I want to invite up uh, Dave uh, Bengardi and Nathanza Minato, if you guys could uh, come up and stand to my right. 
Dave and Natasha um, recently joined Covenant City Church in the past year or uh, uh, in a few months uh, or so in the past membership class. And uh, they are uh, experiencing the commitment and the call to obey Christ in, in, in being baptized um, as, as commanded in the scriptures um, as a communication of their trust and faith in what Christ has done for them on that cross. So uh, Dave and Nathanza, I'm gonna um, read out loud the vows you already said I do too when you did the membership uh, vows with, with the elder here, um, but now in front of the congregation, okay? Dave, Nathanza, do you believe the Bible consisting of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God and its doctrine of salvation to be the perfect and only true doctrine of salvation, do you? I do. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and have no hope except through his sovereign mercy, do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and trust him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel, do you? Do you now resolve and promise and humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as a follower of Christ, do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace, do you? Okay, Dave, if you don't mind coming closer to me. Dave Bengardi, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, uh, let's hold our celebration and let Nathanza be baptized before that. Natanza Minanto, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let's pray. Father, we uh, ask that as we um, do what you've commanded for us to do in your word, uh, to, to apply the covenant sign of, of baptism to those whom you have drawn to yourself. I pray uh, uh, for... for uh, uh, Dave and Nathanza, that they both would remember that they entered into this kingdom not because of anything they've earned, not because of anything they've done, not because they've impressed you with any of their religiosity, but because the cross of Christ has been made real in their hearts by the Spirit, so now they want to live and follow you with every single thing um, they have and every single second uh, they may continue to walk on this earth. And Father, as they do so, I pray that this covenant sign of baptism not only um, bless those who are partaking of it, but also those who are um, a part of it today, witnessing it. And I pray, Father, that believers here are reminded once again of, um, of the fact that they entered the kingdom not because of something they earned, so how can they be kicked out of the kingdom um, because of something they've lost? You cannot lose what you never earned. And we thank you, Father, that this, this sovereign love of yours is true, and pray for those also who are here who may not be believers, who are still considering Christianity and the gospel, that they too uh, may be drawn to you uh, through this, uh, this gospel, not only preached, but uh, described in this act of baptism. Thank you, Father, for who you are. May you receive the glory and honor. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite us to celebrate uh, what the Lord has done in their life. Friends, why don't we stand with me and let's sing this old hymn, The Old Rugged Cross, and reflect on that old rugged cross where our Savior died and our sin was forgiven. There on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame For a world of love, sinners were slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. And I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. All the old. Attraction for me, for 
Our statement of faith today is taken from the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 1, 2, 15, and 18. I will read the questions, and I would like you to respond out loud with the answer. Question 1. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Question two, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. Third, 
how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Question 15. What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? One who is true and righteous human, yet more powerful than all creatures. That is one who is also true God. And question 18. Then who is this mediator, true God, and at the same time a true and righteous human? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who was given to us to completely deliver us and make us right with God. Amen. Thank you, Curtis, for leading us in that. And friends, if you're new to Covenant City Church and you're wondering why we read these documents, that's not scripture per se, is because we believe that there are a few documents out there that's helpful in summarizing for us what the big book of the Bible teaches um, in, in a way that's understandable to, to our minds and also hopefully affectionate to our hearts. And I encourage you guys to study these documents. And if you're ever curious about what it is we believe, uh, check out any of these documents that we've been reading on Sunday mornings, and, and it, it, it's all there, okay? Uh, so friends, as we continue in our time of giving and offering, as always, uh, we want to remind you that if you're not a member at Covenant City Church, to not feel burdened or pressured to give to Covenant City Church, but we do want to continually encourage you to give to your local church, wherever it is that you're a member in, so that you can help and serve them in their efforts of preaching the gospel and making disciples in the city that we love. But if you are a member of Covenant City Church, then it is the duty and delight for the members of a church to help the sustenance of their church um, as we also continue to preach the gospel and make disciples in the city. Uh, and if, like, if you would like to give to us, you can do so uh, through, the, uh, through cash in the offering bag. That's going to be passed uh, by, but also through the QR code that's on the printouts and also on the liturgy behind me. Okay? Let's continue in our time of service as we give back to God that which is rightfully His as a response to the good news that we have heard in Christ. Let's pray before we move on. Thank you, Father, for this great gospel. We have just uh, liturgized and read and sung and um, participated in. I pray that the sweetness of the cross may continue to bear fruit in our hearts and that uh, we will respond and give to you uh, that which didn't belong to us anyways, uh, not to earn any love that we have lacked from you, but because he who was rich became poor uh, so that we may be spiritually rich in him. And let us respond then by giving back to him what is uh, rightfully his. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
seeking to divide With trembling hearts we His roar But your strong arm will crush His power We look to you Again to reign, we love to you, we love to you. All the earth will bow in praise. All the earth will bow in praise. Men, friends, please be seated. All right, friends, let's pray one more time. Father, we pray every week that as you entrust this church with whatever it is you want to entrust us with, that you would also protect this church from making those things um, the things that would make us full of ourselves, the things that will make us feel self-sufficient. You've warned us so many times against trusting in chariots and horses. You've warned us so many times in trusting and putting our faith and our hope and the things of this earth that moth can destroy and thieves can steal, but for some reason, our hearts are just too weak and we always um, rely and trust and find peace and rest when these things abound and feel anxiety and fear and even hopelessness when these things subside. Help us now look to you um, and treat you as God and not make money or whatever other resources you've entrusted to us more than what it is, just merely a tool to worship you through and to preach your gospel with and to um, supply your uh, uh, ministry uh, with as well, that we may continue to preach your gospel and make disciples. Protect the hearts of the leaders of this church, protect the hearts of the members of this church, and uh, grow us up in you as we uh, put you in the throne you belong in our hearts and not money that can so often do so. Father, we also pray the same for other churches in the city, that they too would be so entranced in the gospel um, that they would use whatever it is you've entrusted to them uh, for your name and for your kingdom, and not for their own names and not for their own kingdoms. Um, and Father, we also pray for the continual stability of, of this city and this country as it, as it continues to experience the aftermath of a rather volatile political season, that you would be with uh, uh, the governors, the, the uh, rulers of this, of this land as of now, um, that they would rule in fairness and injustice and, and do their role as you've assigned to them on this earth, but also give your people the perspective and the reminder that your church has endured through multiple uh, ups and downs and the coming and going of many nations and kingdoms and rulers and, and but your, your, your covenant community remains. So I pray Father that as uh, your people in the city and in this country uh, continue to handle whatever uh, come their way, come our way, that we would be able to represent the true king and that is no president of any nation but Christ himself um, and the true king of, of, of the whole earth. So Father help us to use the resources you've entrusted us to communicate this one message uh, to everyone. Um, Christ, the King, who shed his own blood to die for our soul. Father, we end this time of incessant prayer in the way that you have taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, welcome again to Covenant City Church. Let me just do three quick announcements before I dismiss the children. Uh, the first one, um, 
uh, we're, we're growing, and that's a good thing. That's an exciting thing uh, to be part of and experience. But with our growth also comes the necessity for more servants, uh, servant teams, and, and people who serve in, in, in the church. So uh, if you want to serve as a volunteer, here and in CCC in whatever capacity. It could be an usher. It could be a person that passes out the um, offering bags. It could be multimedia. Um, it, could be, it could be anything. Ch children's ministry, which is a really, really big need. So please, please sign up with that. If you want to uh, be a part of that in any way, uh, 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 what's it called? The QR code behind me. You can use the QR code behind me. Um, and you can also go to Church Center um, to, to sign up for any of these positions. Uh, please do sign up. We're in need of your help, uh, or else we will crumble under the weight of, 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 of people who are coming, which is, which is exciting again, but please sign up. Um, and also, there's going to be a welcome booth later outside that's specifically going to be purposed to take anyone here who wants to uh, be part of a volunteer team, okay? If you have questions about the t type of teams we have and the opportunities we have, please go there and check that out. Number two, we also have a volunteer appreciation lunch. See, if you join as a volunteer next year, you might be able to join the volunteer appreciation lunch, which should not be your motivation to serve, but it is a plus and a benefit nonetheless. Okay, but uh, for any current active volunteers uh, that's serving, uh, we do have a lunch uh, to appreciate you guys. It's going to be May 25th from 10 a.m. to noon. Okay, Saturday, May 25th. Your ministry directors should have already contacted you, contacted you or your group with the details, okay? So uh, please, please uh, ask them if you have any questions. And if you do want to sign up for it, for any uh, current volunteers and that's currently serving, okay, there's a QR code that you can sign up through, okay? And if you have any questions about the details, ask your ministry directors or any staff as well. Last announcement is that next Sunday we have a welcome lunch. So if you're new here and you want to kind of get to know people outside of just this Sunday morning space, um, there's going to be a welcome lunch after church. They're going to go somewhere. Um, next Sunday, April 28th, you can also sign up uh, from the welcome booth as well, I believe, or on, on a, um, a planning center as well in church center. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, I want to dismiss the children. Uh, uh, if you have children you want to take to our children's ministry, they can leave through my left, and I think uh, Upper Junior can go to my right, okay? And as they do that, the rest of you who are still here, I want to invite you to rise and greet each other in the name of the Lord. Morning, guys. Uh, before I pray and stop and start, I just want to remind us of a, an announcement that was forgotten that after today, I mean, after the service, there will be a membership meeting today where members of GCC get to be updated about all sorts of things that's been going on with the church, and there are certainly very new, exciting things going on. So please stick around. After the service, there's lunch provided for those of you who signed up and joined the membership meeting, okay? With that in mind, let us pray for the preaching of God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us undeserving, consistently sinful people to approach you today. 
not only as criminals cowering before a judge, but as those who can boldly come to receive your grace, to really taste and see how good you are. Father, as we reflect upon your goodness, reveal to us this day both the depravity of our sins and the sweetness of your grace that we may have them consistently before us and such that it will make the things that we choose ahead of you seem woefully weak and dim in light of your glorious grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me begin this sermon by asking you guys a question to get our brains going, right? Especially for those of you who are Christians this morning. If you were to rate yourself as a Christian, right, if there was to be an evaluation of your performance as a Christian, how would it go? What would the verdict be? Or to maybe phrase it more pointedly to the heart, what do you think your heavenly Father thinks of you? Okay, in a second, I'll give you guys like a minute to think about it and maybe jot down a word or a phrase that comes to mind. And the goal here is not to find these Christian platitudes or the most theologically precise statements, but to see if you were totally honest with yourself, if you were to put yourself in God's shoes, what would you say about yourself? Okay, let me give you like 20 seconds to think about that. That's about 20, right? So let me tell you what most of the time I experience when I think about the question, when I do that exercise. It doesn't feel great. Because the word that most commonly comes to my mind is disappointing. Like I know in the background, God will love me and he'll, he's always going to forgive me and so on. But more immediate to me is that the feeling of the fact that God wishes that I would do better. Because I should have accomplished more with what I've already been blessed with. Like he's given me so much and helped me so many times, but I can't get my act together. The sins that I was prone to in the past are still the same sins that I'm struggling with. I still have the same sorts of selfish thoughts, tempted by the same lust, stumbling over and over again over the same stupid things. And thank God there there is my wife and, you know, my Christian community that affirms me about whatever progress I happen to make. But because I have to live with myself every day and I get to see my flaws every day, if I were to rate myself as a Christian... I would probably still most often say, yeah, not good enough. What about you guys? How'd that feel? Does anyone here feel the same sort of way as me? I wouldn't be surprised if some of you do, especially if you've been Christians for a long time and have been trying to go at this for a while, right? It's kind of hard to really feel good about yourself, especially if you're reformed and you believe in total depravity. Now, on the one hand, right, I got to say that this exercise kind of sets you up for failure because the focus is, of course, on our performance and assessing it against the highest ideals of God's commands. So our shortcomings will inevitably be what will first come to surface before God's grace when we do this. But on the other hand, I think this reveals how our sin casts a shadow over our relationship with God, creates this gap between our Christian theology that says we should be joyful, hopeful, and, you know, peaceful in Christ, and our Christian experience, which is often plagued with feelings of inadequacy, anxiety, and frustration, just like everyone else. Thank God, though, that our Heavenly Father does not leave us in this state. That our Heavenly Father doesn't judge myself, doesn't judge me, as I myself is often prone to judge myself. Because not only does God, is God willing and able to forgive sins, but He also gives us concrete 
guidance about how we can actively be resisting sin, about how we can face the sin that we're always prone to and fight it consistently without feeling like we're always in a losing battle, right? And this is what can be said that the book of Proverbs has been all about practical advice as to how we can live in the light of God's wisdom. And we're going to be studying chapter 7 today. So before we go any further, let's read it. And because we're studying the whole chapter, I'm going to read the whole thing. So bear with me because it's not short, okay? Proverbs chapter 7, this is the word of God. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call your insight, your intimate friend, to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths a man, a young man, lacking sense. Passing along the street, near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of darkness. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay home, now on the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill with, of love till the morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. And with her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or a stag is caught in a fast till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me, and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her path. For many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. This is the word of God. So friends, since the beginning of this year, we've been studying this long first section in the book of Proverbs. And if you've been following along, this section is mainly made up of these 10 lectures from a father to a son, right, with a couple of interludes from Lady Wisdom in between. And these 10 lessons are all about how to live in accordance to God's wisdom. And what we actually just read was actually the 10th and final speech from the father to the son, right? And for those of you guys here who have been going to CCC and has been following along in the series, what, have you noticed, was the last three lectures been about? And if you're thinking of sex and adultery, that's right, no, that, that, that's the right answer, okay? And so the last thing that the father does to teach his son about living in the fear of the Lord is emphasize three times about why he should stay away from the forbidden woman, right? And that should tell us something a little bit about how importantly God sees who we choose to pursue intimate relationships with. Yet, as Tez astutely pointed out, that though the text is immediately talking about sexual or you know, adulterous marital sin, what we learn from this text should absolutely be applied to sin in general. Because the Bible doesn't only describe sin as this terrifying, dangerous enemy, but also just as much as this illicit lover who looks great, it will ultimately be toxic. 
For such is the nature of our struggle with sin. So, the parting words that the Father gives us are some very helpful instructions with regards to how we can resist the seduction of sin. We'll be discussing how in three points from this text about how to do this. To escape sin's seduction, we better, one, go back to the basics, two, grow in awareness of sin's tactics, and three, grasp how our failure can be tragic. Go back to the basics, grow in awareness of sin's tactics, and grasp how failure can be tragic. Okay, let's get into it. Point one, go back to the basics. Now, if you've been reading along in the book of Proverbs, the opening of this text should be very, very uh, familiar to us, right? In all the speeches, the Father tells us first to take His instructions seriously, to make knowing it well and doing it properly of first importance in our lives, right? to cherish it and treasure it, so that by these commands, we can live well, right? This is the moral logic of the Proverbs, right? The basic thing that the book is trying to get us to do. Know God's words and obey Him. It's simple, right? But for any of us who've tried this seriously, we would immediately realize that it's not that easy. Because, as we discussed earlier, our inevitable failure to do them can be quite discouraging and, and frustrating, right? So I actually found the way that this instruction is given in this particular text is helpful. You see, previously, these instructions were spoken of as these ideals that we're supposed to stick to, or even as a kind of treasure that we're supposed to protect. But this time, the instructions are not spoken of as this abstract thing or as an object, but as a person who we're supposed to be relating to. Check out verse 12. It says, to keep the Father's teaching as the apple of your eye. This is an interesting uh, Hebrew idiom that's used a couple of times in the Bible. And all the other times it's used, the phrase is used of Israel being the recipient of God's care, protection, and attention. Right? Because they are the apple of His eye. His most precious relationship. And later in verse 4, it's further emphasized that wisdom is meant to be our sister and then our intimate friend. And let me just clarify that we must resist this understanding of intimate friend as something romantic or erotic in some way. Rather, it's literally actually intimate friend in Hebrew is your known friend, meaning someone really familiar that's actually most often used to refer to like your kinsman, your cousin or something. So it seems like the choice to pick out these two relationships other, all of the, out of all of the close human relationships that we have, right, like your wife, your kids, and so on, the author's intention was always to portray wisdom as someone who knows us, loves us, and has the best intentions for us without having any sexual interest in us. To contrast her with the woman who will, like we're going to talk about, whose interest in us is almost strictly sexual, right? Not to make sex out as something that's inherently bad, but I think to illustrate how the sex drive is so powerful in humans that it's the one of the most effective ways that our judgments can be impaired. Such that the offer of sex can lead us to prefer and heed the advice of a morally questionable stranger above the people who actually know you and love you and care for you, right? And has that ever happened before in life? Therefore, the instruction here is that if we want to resist the allure of something as powerful as sex, the first thing that we must do is actually cherish and honor God's wisdom as a sibling. Or to use a cliche, to make Jesus your best friend. To move towards a meaningful and living relationship with Him so that we can learn how deeply He loves us. To know Him so well and to recognize His voice so much that we don't always have to look it up to know what He's thinking. Isn't this how you really know someone? When you know what they're going to do, when you know what the reaction is going to be, before they actually do it or say it. 
I mean, I've been married for less than 18 months, and my wife has basically become a prophet. Being able to foresee my reactions and know what I'm thinking about without needing to have this conversation with me. And I think the Bible is telling us that it not only is it possible for us to have this familiarity with God, I think this text is making the even stronger case that we need to have this kind of familiarity with God's wisdom, that it needs to be so deeply loved and appreciated by us in order for us to be saved from the clutches of sin that we fall so easily into. So the implication for me, right, is that we've got to have the correct posture as we're practicing our spiritual disciplines in order for them to be effective in our efforts to resist sin. And this posture is a posture of relationality and not one primarily of curiosity or transactionality. Because it's possible for someone, for unusual people like me, and maybe some of you guys, who has an academic interest in the Bible, to read the Bible and listen to theological discussions that most people find convoluted, boring, and insufferable to do that for fun. But that doesn't mean that my curiosity about the subject makes me any closer and gives me any better relationship with God than some atheist who's a you know, history of religion scholar or something. And I have also personally found myself drawing near to God, praying more, doing more ministry, and so on, because I want something, be it some profound spiritual insights or supernatural help or whatever it may be. And it's certainly great to have a scholarly interest in the Bible, and it's totally appropriate to come to God with our needs because He is willing and able to help. But if that's the main motivation for whatever participation that we have in Christianity right now, friends, the Bible is showing us how our faith will not have the necessary resilience to stand on the day when inevitably our flesh is weak and an opportunity to sin presents itself before us. Because the only thing powerful enough to push against the pull of sin is love. When there is someone who we love more and we would rather listen to and trust more than the sin that tempts us. So it begs the question, right? Like, how do you approach God? with a pasture of relationality. Well, I guess it's like, kind of like the pursuit of another human being for the sake of relationship, right? The relationship itself becomes the goal and not what we get out of it. It's an attitude that perceives the time spent together and the actions that we do to serve each other as the good things in and of themselves. It, what makes us open up ourselves to understand each other and not to get them only to love us, but to learn to love what each other loves so that we can be united in love. For example, to use my wife again, right? She has watched more sports with me and actually is beginning to like some of it than probably ever before in her life because I love it so much and she wants to be with me because I'm so excited. Unfortunately, I cannot bring myself to reciprocate by getting to know her and her Korean reality shows. Sorry, Sayang, you're much better than me. But all that to say is that love takes the initiative. It draws near. So what I'm trying to say is that our spiritual disciplines, the basics of Christianity, prayer, Bible study, church, community, these are relational times with God. Times in prayer is time spent in conversation. Time spent in God's Word is time spent listening to God. Time spent here at church and with community is time spent in God's house with His family. And it's invaluable because first and foremost, it is tightening us with God. It's working on our relationship. So it's never supposed to feel like an obligation, like we're doing homework or trying to work off some debt. Because ultimately, being under the, God, uh, the guidance of God's wisdom 
isn't something that we got to do, but first and foremost is something that we get to do. It's a get-to thing, not a got-to thing. Privilege. Then why does it always feel like an obligation? Some of you might ask. Why hasn't it felt like, hasn't it felt like that I'm getting any closer in my relationship with God or any closer to getting over my sin, though I've been really trying hard genuinely to seek Him? And I totally understand, right? This can be quite a frustrating situation if you're here. So let me propose one reason why this might be the case for you and offer you a solution that's been working at least for me, right? Because I've been there a couple of times myself. Perhaps it's not what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it that's the issue. Rather, how we've been doing it. Because the transformative effects of living in a, vi- in a vibrant relationship with God is experienced most vividly and clearly when this relationship is intentionally and directly being applied to the specific blessing that we are seeking when we are turning to sin. And finding out what that is, is what point two is going to be about, okay? So point two, to resist the seduction of sin, we should grow in awareness of sin's tactics. Let's go back to the text and discuss verses 6 to 21, right? The bulk of our text here that describes the interaction between this woman and the young man. But notice that the actions of the woman, this temptress, gets much more attention than the man. The man's participation in this affair is only discussed in verse 6 to 9, and the rest of it is about the woman. Not to be sexist or prejudiced in any way, but to illustrate what a slippery slope this is. Because what is it that this young man, who is the characterization of someone who falls into the snare of sin, what's his role in all this? I think the text portrays it as simply that he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He fell at the temptation because he just wandered right in front of her. Now, it is a bit suspicious, right? Like, why would he be wandering around like this in the dark of night, right? It's not this well-lit modern city. Bad people and dangerous animals are usually out at night, and shady things are usually what happens. So, like, you know, why are you even there, bro? But this text does not indicate at all that this man was looking for this woman. Rather, she met him. She pounces because it never occurred to the foolish young man that he was so close to ruin and he just mindlessly put himself in harm's way. So one point of application here is certainly asking ourselves, are we aware of what dangers might be lurking wherever we go? What things do you see online? What kinds of people Have you been around? What kind of places have you gone to that has provided for you the temptation for, or the opportunity for temptation to come find you? And if you notice them, friends, the Bible here is giving you the advice to spare yourself the trouble and avoid them at all costs. That being said, it's certainly clear that temptation is certainly not entirely avoidable. Maybe because of the weakness of our flesh or due to circumstances that we cannot foresee and are beyond our control, we might suddenly find ourselves at temptation's door and we will need to face her. So then the father's description of her in verse 10 to 15 is trying to teach us how we can be prepared to face her so that we could see her coming and defend ourselves against what she's going to be trying to to do, and the description here highlights three things about her character. That sin is manipulative, rebellious, and sneaky. First, notice in verse 10, manipulative, right? That she is specifically said that she is only dressed like a prostitute. That she is not herself one, right? Meaning that this is not necessarily her line of work. In fact, based on 
the description of her life in our text, it's more likely that she's actually the wife of a pretty wealthy merchant. So this definitely seems like a lot more like pleasure than work, right? So she was thirsty and even willing to resort to such lows to get her man, even pretending to be something she's not because she is wily and guarded of heart, meaning that she's filled with hidden agendas and is proficient at masking her intentions and getting people to do what she wants. And verse 11, secondly, tells us that she's rebellious. It says there, actually, that she's loud and wayward. I'm not a huge fan of this translation because it makes her sound like a lunatic, but I prefer something more like rowdy and rebellious. Because what this seeks to describe is someone who lacks composure or self-control, not thoughtful about what she says or does, because she is also rebellious, and she hates all authority, interested only in doing what is right in her own eyes, such that there's this restlessness that makes her dissatisfied with what sounds like very comfortable living conditions that her husband has given her. So rebellious that she's willing to throw away and dishonor his, her husband and everything he has provided for her to satisfy her own desires. And lastly, in verse 12, it says that she's sneaky. She's in the streets, in the markets, waiting behind every corner, lying in wait. That's a term that usually describes like hunters and robbers and soldiers when they're hiding in the bushes to ambush their target. Now, can anybody here think of another creature in the Bible who hates authority and has a history of sneakily lurking in hidden places? who likes to manipulate humans with smooth words and getting them to rebel against God. It's the snake, isn't it? The original tempter. The one who first got us to do what is right in our own eyes. And that evil that was personified as a serpent, I mean, represented as a serpent in Eden, is now personified as an adulterous woman. And the Bible here is saying is that he, is now still doing his work because although the pitch might be different now, the product is still the same. And so let's look at verse 13 to 20 and notice what this adulteress is trying to sell, how she's trying to sell the sin. Look at verse 13 to 16. The woman here is totally playing into this man's ego. She rushes in and immediately kisses him, says that, She's been waiting and so on, right? So she offers him approval, makes him feel chosen and special and provides for him this opportunity for excitement, right? For spontaneous adventure and romance. Then in verse 14 to 18, she basically offers him comfort, luxury, satisfaction of all of his earthly desires, right? Most scholars in uh, there, think that verse thir- in verse 14, and she's talking about the temple and stuff. She's actually offering him fancy food under the veneer of religion, right? So back then, people offered meat when they made sacrifices, and they get to keep most of the time, most of it, and bring it back home. And meat back then was not, you know, a common thing that they ate. It's something that's really special and only reserved for the most special of occasions. So. She's insinuating to the man that she has some of this luxurious food she's willing to share. In fact, she has her place really hooked up. She got the nice sheets on, Egyptian linen, and and this super expensive perfume, which is what myrrh is. And so, she's saying to her that with her, he can experience all of these luxuries and be completely satisfied until he's completely full. This offer, friends, sounds like to a young man with raging desires like an all-you-can-eat buffet at a candy store for a kid and then a trip to Disneyland. An abundance of everything in the world that you could want too good to be true. 
and all this, along with the assurance that the situation is safe and under control. Right? That's what she's trying to say in verse 19 to 20. My husband is gone for a long time. He's never going to find out. But is there anything offering, I mean, anything wrong with the things that this woman is offering? Is it wrong for wanting love? Is it a sin to be satisfied with the great things that God has filled creation with? Can you blame someone for wanting to be safe and secure? Not necessarily, right? These are good things. And God never intended to withhold any of these blessings from us. But the problem has always been and will continue to be that we make these things ultimate. And we would much rather use our own wisdom and power to access these as soon as possible instead of running to God and trusting in His method and timing to grant us these at the right time and in fullness. So let me ask each of us here. Have you fallen prey to the seduction of sin? Every single one of us here has faced her and will continue to face her in the future. So let us search our heart, friends, and identify and name what is it that we're truly desiring? What is it that we really want when we're tempted? What is it exactly that you think that God can't or won't give that we need so much that we're willing to look for alternative solutions to get it? This is what is firstly important identify and name in order that we can leverage our relationship with God so that we can find victory over this temptation. Because it's only after we've identified this will we begin to internalize how sin is ultimately powerless to satisfy us and how trusting God for these desires is actually the best thing that we can do. And this process is hopefully what can be explained in the final point. Point three, to resist the seduction of sin, we better grasp how failure is tragic. So, in the remaining section of our text, the father concludes his lecture to his son by giving him a stern warning through three damning metaphors about the true nature of this woman of sin given to us so that we can see through her very tempting proposition so that we can look past Right? The Egyptian sheets, the perfume, and whatever creature comfort she offers, and see her for who she really is. And the first metaphor here, in verse 22 and 23, is one of a hunter who baits her prey into traps, lulling us into this false sense of security, and then all of a sudden, rendering them stuck, vulnerable, and helpless. In too deep, unable to resist her bad intentions in our lives because sin is a very much devious enemy who is actually skilled in hiding her traps in the most seemingly innocent harmless and even sometimes seemingly necessary things the second metaphor here is verse 25 26 and he speaks of the adulterer adult, adulteress as a mass murderer right Many of a throng are her victims, he says. So the idea here is not that sin is only dragging you down with her, but sin is actively causing your destruction. In the original context of this text in ancient Israel, should this affair be exposed, the young man, at best, the best case scenario for him, would be giving up his life to become this husband's slave. Right, and though I suspect that most of here, most of us here, I hope, is not involved in anything that can even come close to killing us, let us not be careful to be complacent. Because of sin's sneaky nature, this death might not come in a single blow or a single moment, but with a thousand paper cuts. Right, death by a thousand paper cuts, slowly but surely draining the life that we came to sin looking for. So perhaps a personal example might be helpful here, right? In ages BC, before Christ, I lived an insane double life. 
still showing up at church, appearing to be a relatively functional person. But behind the scenes, there were things that I was involved in that I knew I shouldn't be, that I just deemed best for most people not to know. So I learned just to lie about it constantly because it was more comfortable and even convenient that way. And it became so habitual hiding myself that I even started lying about things that I didn't need to lie about. Even eventually, lying, believing in my own lies. But eventually, friend, keeping up with these lies and to whom I've told these lies became so exhausting such that I had to maintain a comfortable distance with people who I thought shouldn't know that side of my life always being anxious about revealing too much and only being able to be comfortable with those people who do know and have become habitual and unrepentant sinners and liars themselves. So the thing that I was doing in darkness, that I did genuinely enjoy, that I thought gave me adventure, comfort, camaraderie, life, it's actually robbing me of the deep and meaningful relationships which make life really worth living. Because these can only be experienced with open honesty. And eventually, the excitement and joy that I derived from that which I tried so hard to hide started giving me diminishing returns, but increasingly serious consequences, ultimately leaving me miserable, devoid of peace, but full of guilt and regret. And that, friends, is living death. Right? Have you experienced anything like that? Or witnessed something like that? Then sooner or later, directly or not, sin is indeed what will be the end of us. That's what verse 27 there is trying to say, that her house is the gateway to Sheol, which is where the Hebrew, is the word for the grave, where the Hebrew people thought that the dead people go, or in the words of ACDC, she's the highway to hell, okay? And that is how the father's lesson to the son ends, by scaring him straight. Don't go there, otherwise you'll die. And that's pretty handy to know for sure, but it does leave us a bit wanting, doesn't it? Are we just supposed to try our best and run away? Because sin's going to be coming at us, and I personally don't trust in my own willpower to do that consistently. So it seems like the tragic consequences of our failure will come back to haunt us somehow again in the future. This is why the New Testament is really great. Because God himself knows that educating us on the true nature of sin is only half the work. The human heart needs something else, someone else, someone better to hold on to. We can capture our hearts such that he can make the adulterous advances eventually feel like nothing more than silly suggestions. Someone who will reliably give us what we need and leave us with no regrets at the end. And if you've been to CCC for a while, you know who this person is, right? It's Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God and tangible human flesh that he sent to us. And unlike the adulterers, Jesus is not a hunter seeking to take our lives. Jesus is the good shepherd who loves his sheep and will never let him perish. And Jesus was never about taking any lives, but when he raised, what did Paul say he become? He became a life-giving spirit. And his house? His house is the heavens. And in his house, there are many rooms. Each of us here are invited along with those who we love. And in this place, will we be truly safe and the grave will never 
touch us again. You see, what we need to do there, we need to identify the ruin of sin and juxtapose it, contrast it with the promises and truth of God. That is the only way we'll ever experience meaningful progress against our battle, in our battle against sin. Only when we can see clearly how harmful sin has been or potentially can be to those to us and those we love, while at the same time being keenly aware of the surpassing worth of Jesus Christ our Lord and the beauty of His resurrection, when these two things are truly in front of us and have become the lenses through which we look at life, we'll, we'll be able to, as the psalm that we read earlier say, taste and see that the Lord is good. May this then, will the words of the song that we're going to sing ring so true to us that the things of this earth will seem strangely dim in the light of His glorious face. So for those of us here right now who are encouraged to fight this battle with sin in a fresh way, I encourage you to first of all, come back and work on your relationship with Jesus. No matter how strange you think this relationship is from you, Jesus ain't going anywhere. And he is so willing to restore to you the joy of your salvation. So embolden yourself to do the uncomfortable work of searching your hearts to see what is it really that is attracting you to sin right now. And ask the Lord to help you well, to help you show clearly how your sin is destructive, but also at the same time how in the Lord you will be satisfied. And he will not withhold that from you, friends. The Bible promises it. However, if you are aware, or if you don't know, that you have this relationship with Jesus yet, and somehow today you've been convicted or been made clear to you about how you've been falling to the seduction of sin and are thinking about right now the ruin that it's caused your life. Jesus is inviting you today to have this relationship with him. His door is open. He will not turn you away. And if you would come to him, make him your intimate friend, cherish him, get to know him, and commit yourself to him, Jesus will heal you of your waywardness. He will correct your course and he will restore you in the abundance of life that sin has taken from you. And friends, when our posture, when our strategy is first and foremost to cling to the cross for dear life, our fight will sin with sin will not feel like a losing battle, but a war that we have already won should we keep on fighting. Amen? So let us come to Jesus again. Let's pray. Blessed are you, Lord, King of the universe, who has given us undeserving humans every good thing for us to enjoy. We acknowledge, Lord, that your creation is more than we deserve and it has more than enough for us to enjoy in abundance but we foolishly lord confess that we have sought other things outside of you to satisfy us father i pray by your holy spirit to not let our souls be satisfied in these earthly things to not let ourselves be comfortable with the adulterous woman help us by your holy spirit lord to identify the seduction of sin Show us when we are being tempted and when we are being foolish, but also at the same time show us the surpassing worth of knowing you, the surpassing riches of your grace and the peace that surpasses all understanding that comes with you. Because only when we have the grasp of this, we know that you are good to us, that everything else, everything else that jeopardizes our relationship with you seems completely foolish and not worth it. 
Jesus' his name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's sing this song, this last song together and stand up with me. benefits of preaching through whole books from beginning uh, to the end is that you see repeated themes in the book. Um, and usually when something's repeated, it matters a lot to the one who's repeating it. Uh, and the past four to five sermons uh, through the book of Proverbs, God has been repeating over and over and over again to us to fight and battle against the temptation of sin. It must be important to him. Uh, so as we're reminded of the dangers of uh, what lurks out there. Let us not just fight sin because of the fear of its consequences, but also let the New Testament fulfill uh, the shadows of the Old Testament, 
finding its substance in Christ. That is the one who we turn our eyes to so that our fight towards sin wouldn't just be a willpower fight and a fear battle, but rather a natural being drawn to the one we turn our eyes to that overshadows even death itself. He the one who does not lurk so that we may die, but instead gave his life so that we may live. Let him turn all else um, into shadows in his glorious grace. So friends, I'm gonna uh, now uh, give us our benediction, but also a reminder for the members of Covenant City Church that after this, we do have a members meeting with some important stuff that we'd love to share with you. So please join that if you're able to. But friends, as we leave our time of worship today, go out there representing to the world people who hate sin, not just the consequences of it, but hate sin itself because they love the one who died for them. Receive now, friends, your benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in his peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Do you know?